Hello, we are here with Pete Seidman. Um, thank you so much, Pete, for accepting. It's a pleasure to be here again. Yes, because the first time that I actually sat down to talk with Pete, he struggled. He did an enormous effort to speak in Spanish. Yeah, <laughs> that was that was a great show. Era, mejor, era peor por los que uh, escuchando que por yo cuando hablaba. Showed a lot of courage. I remember he, he said that right before the show that he felt like it was like during college, like cram session, all right. But I think it came out wonderful, you know. Um, but anyways, now we will be speaking in English, and I really appreciate how um, you're willing to talk under just short notice and the fact that we have a tropical storm in the background. Like, this room is kind of having a flooding problem. But, um, Pete, so I want to uh, really just jump into the, um, the topic of, first of all, how has activism been un affected during coronavirus? Because we were talking on the phone earlier how a lot of stuff has happened, like how the Cuban embassy was um, attacked by the terrorists, the staged a coup or attempt to kidnap Maduro. Um, we, didn't, we did nothing concerning that. We didn't even have a meeting that I know of. Um, although you do complain, I don't read the emails. But um, how has coronavirus affected um, activism, in, at least in South Florida, in, in, from your perspective? Well, I mean, I think that we've been crippled in, in the most important way, which is that activism is based on going out and winning people to new ideas and different ideas and then organizing ourselves. The strength that we have against the power of this government is the power of our organized numbers. And with the social distancing that has to be the responsibility of serious activists, it makes it impossible to do those kinds of actions that we did before. Um, you notice that there's right-wing demonstrations demanding that we want to go back to work and open up the government, where people come in close proximity without masks. And it's an extremely irresponsible thing where it's already shown up the statistics that, for example, one of those demonstrations in Wisconsin, where they went to the state capitol, I think 16 days later, there was a spike of coronavirus cases. and the people who, you know, they do surveys when you get your test, and people said they had been at a mass event 16 days before. So this is not a joke. You know, the yeah. disease doesn't care about your politics. Um, so we're not going to subject, we're not going to do that to the people that we seek to lead and the allegiance we want to acquire through the power of our ideas. Mm -hmm. So it's been difficult. In my case, uh, the Cuba Solidarity Movement, we've begun to develop applications with the Zoom that have really let us do some amazing things. We had webinars that involved people from Cuba, from Venezuela, trade union leaders, fighters from South Africa, uh, working class leaders here in the U.S., like mm -hmm. uh, the president of the New York State Nurses Association, uh, Chris Smalls, the fighter who was fired from Amazon for protesting health and safety conditions there. We were all over the world and all over the map politically, but we could get together in this digital form, which yeah. we could never do in real life in healthy times, and begin to develop, you know, a knowledge of each other and our ideas and a common fight. So that's great, but it's not, it's digital, it's not personal. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing. We are considering now whether it's, it's reasonable and responsible to organize perhaps a caravan, which has been done in some other cities, yeah. where you could maintain distancing and the safe participation of people. Uh, because there is an urgent need, as you mentioned, to take up some of these attacks that the U.S. government has made um, on Cuba and Venezuela, uh, as well as the attacks they're carrying out through people's distraction from the COVID situation. Yeah, because we're all... It's essentially, people are worried about their own uh, personal lives. I mean, we've, we've got like more than uh, three million uh, people uh, unemployed, and, and, and even um, mental health um, issues on million. the rise. You know, thirty million people. Yeah, yeah, and um, like with so many personal issues, it, it can be a bit too much, a bit too overwhelming. I mean, I've got friends that are saying, "I feel depressed. I've got problems. I have no job. I have like." 
even people that are actively um, busy, keeping themselves busy, they're still working. They're saying, yeah, but I lost this job, so now I have no health insurance. They're, I think the, the statistic was that it was like around 27 million have lost their health care. So now you can really make a strong case for um, let's at least revisit, let's visit, right, the topic. Let's put that over the table because um, with uh, the Democrats, like Nancy Pelosi insisting that just uh, funding COBRA and just, just – basically going through so much trouble just to make the the old system intact so that we don't have the chance to even come up with something that will last beyond the coronavirus um so yeah with everybody just focused on surviving um it can be a bit tricky how um you've got also the government but even the private sector, like corporations. So you see how Amazon has, is expanding. It's growing nonstop. How they had that horrible treatment of like, like uh, Mr. Smiles, how you were saying that you had a conversation with him and all that. And you have, you've got concerns over the surveillance, the growing surveillance, how um, clearly it, it's possible that, that we might end up losing even more civil rights, right? If we let just the government unroll uh, new new policies and new ways of doing things. And there's even talks of cutting uh, the budget on education. Um, what would you say is like the biggest threat right now that we're facing in the midst of this problem where we're so focused on our own uh, private lives that it, it might be super easy for the government to slip by uh, unnoticed certain um, things that we norm in normal peace times we wouldn't allow? Well, that's what they're doing. I mean... It's a, it's a medical crisis and a healthcare crisis, but it intersects with a, a, a social and a political crisis. And the, the government of the United States, through its actions, is exposing things that people didn't necessarily see before this happened. I mean, we were always told we're the richest country in the world. Our health care is the best. Our epidemiologists are the best. It's everything is the yeah, best. They always, they always mention right? that, it, that, oh, celebrities from the world, right? Rich people come to the United States to get treatment. Yeah, but what about the poor people living in the United States? I mean, is there, is there anybody who would seriously say that the idea of health care for all, you know, for a nationally funded equal opportunity health care, um, is a crazy idea at this point because they were telling us oh people don't want to lose their private insurance and so forth but we see that the health care system in this country has been hollowed out yes is, is there an echo or is that i'm just asking about the sound is there an echo technician tech support yeah, remember, I'm listening on a separate speaker, so it might be that, that you're hearing it. I'm not sure about the transmission, though. I'm pretty sure it, it won't be affected. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about that, Pete. It, it, it's fine. Okay. I'm sorry. It just got me confused. No, no, um, it, it, it's, it's fine. It's just that it's right here next know, to my we're, microphone. We're all, we're, we're all wearing masks now to show our respect for other people and that we don't want to be unconscious spreading of the virus. But this capitalist society that we live in had been wearing a mask for decades, projecting a certain image. Behind it, things were being hollowed out. I mean, we thought we lived in a society where if we got sick, we could be okay. Or at least we were told that. Um, we were told that we're in a society where people believe in equality, where everybody has an equal chance. You know, all these things, but as this as this uh, pandemic has hit, we see that there's gigantic inequalities in the society, and, and it's only the getting worse. Who are yes. dying from this disease are are black people, are Latino people, are immigrants, are the people in the lowest quartile of the workforce. Yes, those are the people who are most hit. The public health facilities are falling apart. Um, an example: this Anthony Cuomo, the governor of New York. Yes. So many, you know, he has these news conferences every day and people are people say, oh, he's so much better than Trump. And he's the responsible adult in the room of politics. But um, they're not looking at the fact of what was behind his mask, of how for the last five years he's been gutting the public health care system in New York City. He's been cutting back the staffing levels, the availability of emergency rooms, the supplies mm -hmm. and equipment. Because that's been the overall trajectory of this government has been to cut back on the social safety net of the people in this country, just like they're cutting back on people all around the world. 
and now, now would, we see I, it, it would make they could perhaps make the case that oh these are budget cuts because we want to be fiscally responsible uh, conservative and all that but you see that that there is an unlimited check for bailing out the private corporations so it's like okay so you're saying we can't have medicare for all because you know who's going to pay for that but apparently it you, we can have indiscriminate spending if um hey we lost you there hold on hold on p sorry let's, let's call back again we lost the image there. I gotta put my power on. what's happening um we lost the image i mean i can hear you but i can't see you even now okay i see you now yeah okay i had to put a charger on my phone i'm sorry so i okay the phone now we're good I mean, we can just edit it, or we, I mean, because we're not live, we'll, we will be publishing this afterwards. But then again, it is the bloopers that make everything more human. So <laughs> people really appreciate those. But as I was saying, that yes, there is all the money in the world. We can print, we can borrow, we can give away billions of dollars for these private companies, all for the sake of. So the argument goes that they're you know the too big to fail category, because and that they create jobs, that it's necessary, that it's like top priority. What would you say to those people that say that that well they we need to bail out say the cruise industry or the airline industry even though during their high peak times of profits they essentially use that that money to just buy back their own stocks but okay what would you say to that argument that we need to bail out the big corporations because they are essential super vital for the american economy and yet it's just so hard. And I think Lindsey Graham has said that over his dead body, Americans are going to get a second $1,200 check because it's just like too much. Yeah. What would you say to those people? Well, I mean, part of the problem that I've talked to you about before is this idea of a we, that there's a we. I mean, look at what the government is doing. It's, it should be teaching us that there is no we in this society. This, this government is completely tied into defending the interests of big business and corporations it's it, it it's it's doing the same thing in terms of the recovery of the economy that the obama administration did in 2008 all these bailouts are shoveling tons of unregulated cash into corporate mouths and really almost nothing is going into the needs of working people and the big majority of people in this country it's a demonstration of what they really care about. And they're using the crisis to advance their interests on every front, not just in terms of uh, helping Boeing, but not helping the workers at Boeing. You know, ordering yeah. meatpacking workers to go back to work so they can have their, you know, the supply chain of food, but not caring about the workers who go into those plants that are some of the biggest clusters of the disease outside of uh, elder care facilities right in prisons yeah that just tells you a lot um so in my and and it's not just that because they're also doing it in foreign policy during this time they're moving forward they tried to invade venezuela and, you know they, they say oh it's not us but they they have their agents who staged this uh attack on venezuela they have um been tightening the campaign against Cuba and Venezuela in terms of economic sanctions and so forth against Iran. I mean, many countries in the world, they're advancing their um, sanctions at a time when we should be saying not sanctions, but solidarity with what mm -hmm. we need in the fight against COVID-19. The exact opposite of a poorer country like Cuba, for example, which has sent medical teams to 27 countries or more that have asked for help all around the world, including relatively wealthy countries like Italy, um, whose biotech industry has developed medicines that, in the case of China, proved to be extremely effective, for which the U.S. government is trying to prevent them from even using, at their, that other countries are asking to be able to use. So uh, it's a multi-front offensive that they're carrying out mm -hmm. under the smoke screen of the pandemic. Clearly, or I should say, it's not. A, I'm sorry, you there. It's not a smokescreen. It's a real, it's a real thing. But they're they're using people's preoccupation with it to advance an agenda underneath that. Yeah, it's a typical thing. I mean, 
when people are distracted, as some people have said, when you see the press go railing nonstop against Trump, you should look in the other direction to find out what they're trying to get us entertained about with, you know, to like to to um, draw everybody's focus away from the real issues and then to just be stressing about, oh, what did Trump do? What did he say? Which at the end of the day is counterproductive. It, it really leads to nothing and it, it gets people's high blood pressure up, but you don't really effect effectively do any change by just going and online and complaining trump. about trump it's not an agenda it's not just trump this is a completely bipartisan thing that's going on exactly i mean exactly the dem the democratic party has not presented any serious alternative no. program for what he's doing i mean they may be arguing about a few dollars here or there and whether we get another thousand dollar breadcrumb you know from the masters in washington which is will be important to some people but it's not an alternate plan that says we need health care for all. You know, we need to fight the racist discrimination, which has become more and more apparent out of this. Um, they don't really have an alternate program uh, to what he's saying. And they're not even defending. They're not standing up and defending science in a bold and resourceful way against these ignorant flaunters of facts who you know, run the government uh, today. Mm -hmm. It's. No, I mean, it's a bipartisan that, problem we have. No, yes, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, like how Victor Nieto <laughs> goes on around about the, we need a third party, right? The, like the People's Movement for for a part a workers party and, and all that. Uh, clearly, there is a, there is a demand more than ever. I would say um, it doesn't mean that the third parties have a chance this time around. Um, I personally think that Trump has a very likely chance of winning yet again because of the whole ra rallying around the flag thing. Even if the economy is bad, it usually uh, t in times of crisis, people tend to be like more conservative and, and they're just going to go with the, the lesser two evils and all that. We know. But I think that clearly the Democratic Party is not uh, wanting to offer a solution when 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 Nancy Pelosi just stands in front of her fridge and she's got the ice cream clearly they are out of touch and all with the people and clearly they would rather have uh, Donald Trump win rather than give Bernie Ch Sanders a chance um, I mean we're kind of just already slipping by into the whole elections topic even though um, clearly we wanted to focus more on workers rights but again um, before we, we leave the whole topic of elections, um, do you think that the, the pandemic actually benefits Trump or is it bad? Because at the beginning, there, I remember there's like a change because at the beginning, um, the Republicans were insisting that that no, this is this isn't going to hurt Trump. This is just the Democrats trying to explode the whole country. We can close it up. It's fine. But now they're they're trying to open up the, the country and they're insisting that uh, it's the Democrats that want to keep the country closed because the Democrats want to see the United States fail. And well, you know the talking points, and it, it's kind of bewildering to some. And I feel like it's just on and on the same type of yarn that really again leads to nothing. But in terms of the, the, the economic problem that we're having and the fact that we're now in a depression, do you think there, there, there is a possibility for advancing more, more progressive policies or will this just benefit the establishment because they'll, they'll use that, that conservative argument that now is not the time to experiment, um, let's just go all out and um, be as conservative as possible. Like, what, do you, what do you think is, the, the, is gonna be like the, the result of, of this uh, current pandemic well, in the political me, the sphere, of... in the political sphere, because Bernie right, is just supporting the... Biden. You know, like there was no revolution effectively. That ended. That sizzled down and got watered down. Well, it was a watered down lie from the very beginning, because from the very beginning, Sanders said that he was going to do what he did. Yeah. And it was his followers who didn't want to hear that. You know, it was his followers who said. Oh no! This is look at all the people who want to be socialists now, and this is represents a chance to build something really progressive inside the Democratic Party and so forth. But it was all in their heads; it wasn't in Sanders' head. And in my opinion, you know, what he was doing was basically co-opting sentiments that were looking for a fight to get them back in the Democratic Party. And his oh. performance since he bowed out of the race has been disgraceful in my opinion because if you're a serious fighter for working people yeah. 
I'm sorry, you look like you have a pained look on your face. It's, the, it's just that I, I couldn't agree more because um, he's not doing you, you can't really, you doesn't... can't expect Biden to pull any concessions and kind of advance any of, of Bernie Sanders' platforms because, well, he already gave him the vote. It's like, well, no, you kind of lost your chance there. No, it's not going to happen. Know when you're, you have to know when you're being played. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. You have to know when you're being played. There was nothing different. Fool me once, Sanders. to fool me twice, it's on me, yeah. Right? It was nothing different about Bernie Sanders, and there was nothing different about Joe Biden at the beginning of the primary and now. Okay? Except in the case of Sanders, who called for a revolution and all this stuff, in the time when people are really in a fight, as far as I can see, he's disappeared. All the fire and all the fire and all the calls for action and the, that we're not just about B, we're about us. I don't see the actions, you know, the the demands, finding the creative ways to fight. I mean, he, he, he had, you know, everybody's affected by the ability to call rallies and so forth, but I don't hear any political alternative being put, put forward by him yeah. at all. No. So, but I want to, I just want to say one thing or a few, couple of things to frame this discussion about politics. You know, one thing is that I, I think we should, there was a writer who said that we should look at this pandemic in a certain way as a portal to a hmm. new, to what comes at the end of it. Because I don't think there's too many working people who want to, who want to come out of this crisis and say, oh, we're back to the normal that we had when we went in. Okay. I mean, I think people will be relieved to get past the isolation and the quarantines and so forth. Yeah. And the quarant and the quarantinies. <laughs> but uh, the, the fact is, is that we need to be imagining what kind of world we want to live in, what kind of society we want to live in on the other side of this, which, which will be, which needs to be a society that's more prepared to handle medical crises. I mean, these pandemics are never going to go away. You know, part of the reason they're happening more and more is because humans are crushing up against nature more and more in a world where there's a climate crisis and nothing's really being done about it. And some of these problems of people jostling up against animals and so forth are really what's underlying these kind of pandemics and these new kinds of viruses that we see spreading. And the medical challenges, the challenges to our health care are not going to go away. They're only going to get deeper because yes. governments are less and less able to handle them and do anything about them or willing to do anything about them. So we need to think that is when I say we, not a fake we of the people of the United States, the government of the United States, yes. but a we of working people and our allies, farmers and others who yes. are most impacted by this. And I don't want to go back to what we had before. I want to figure out ways to fight so that the rights of people to health care, to a decent job, and so yes. forth are prote more protected, not less protected. And and that so the other thing about that is then what is the place of electoral politics in that process? Because I think that electoral process, the electoral process right now, is is more and more clearly a farce. It's not really addressing what our next steps have to be. For example, and I think this is one of the most important things happening in mm -hmm. politics now and coming out of this pandemic, is that. The rulers of this country want people to go back to work. The anti-scientific nonsense that Trump spouts or Kent spouts is designed to um, obscure and undermine the severity of the disease and the dangers to people because the capital that they have, the big auto plants, the meatpacking plants, the fields that are being plowed under while people are going hungry, the only way they make money out of that is by applying human labor to that, those dead machines. It's only the labor of working people that brings those machines to life and the production and sale of commodities that gives them the profits, which are their only motive for, for what they are in this world. And they don't really care if they kill a lot of people to get us back to work. That's the, that's the real economics that underlie their push to get America open again. And in resistance to that, we're seeing that the workers who are most affected by it are opening up lines of resistance, protests, picket lines, strikes. You know, right now in the Yakima Valley of, of uh, Washington State, there's been six strikes by farm workers not wanting to go back until the companies can give them masks and sanitary 
conditions right. to do the work of getting our food. That's a life and death question. So, I mean, what is your position then um, to, on, on this subject? Should we open up the country right now, as Miami Day is going to do in the next week or so, or should we hold on? Because, I mean, if, at the end of the day, I mean, it, it's a pretty convincing argument when when they say, well, you know, it's either die or die because we simply cannot sustain uh, an economy where everybody's just sitting back at home and, you know, we're, we're just printing out money nonstop. Obviously, the money is not going to the people. It's going to the to these companies. But can, can I mean, I'm of the, uh, my Nobody my should have to go back. Nobody should have to go back to work unless it's safe. I don't care if no, the, I agree I don't with care. that. Yeah, you the don't fight, want to put people's the lives fight at risk. Has to be, right? So, so the fight has to be. We want more. We want the like, for example, in Florida, uh, three million people, I think it is, in the state filed yep. for unemployment insurance, and only forty percent of them, after forty or fifty days, have even gotten their first check. Yes, we need a we need a fight to get that money right now, for people who are unemployed. We need mm -hmm. a fight to create. If you want to create jobs, um, let's have a fight to create safe, government-funded jobs to deal with some of the real problems we mm -hmm. have. Um, we need, you know, there are, there are issues like that that we can fight for before we reopen the economy, or before I shouldn't say we, as I say, I'm not a real <laughs> we guy. Uh, they want to open the economy. We have to fight to make sure that it's opened under conditions that are safe for us. And, and like I said, farm workers, um, there were strikes of sanitation workers in, in Pittsburgh, the Amazon workers who have yeah. organized strikes and job actions, the nurses, our healthcare professionals who are picketing outside of hospitals demanding personal protection equipment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, it's not a negligible amount of struggle that's opening up yeah. along these lines. And to me, that's one of the most important things that's happening in American politics right now. It's much more important than whether Joe Biden beats Donald Trump, because we already know that both of those parties are carrying out Tweedledum and Tweedledee, okay? But the fight of working people to be safe is one that really challenges the fundamentals of, of politics. Do you think, um, do you think it's, uh, like, like for instance, with regards to the the whole the whole Democrats and Republicans that they're all they're all the same thing and all that with just minor differences. Um, a really brief brief question because um, I didn't want I wanted to like before we end this and we definitely need a part two. Um, I think it's like I'm a little bit stressed out the fact that it's Friday night and, and it's, we've got this tropical storm and all that. <laughs> but um, I'm sorry if you... I'm upsetting you with my. No, 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 it's fine. No, I, I love how you're, you're very um, free-minded and all that. Um, what do you think about Biden's then um, proposal that he is going to um, restore diplomatic relations to the full extent that Obama had it? Because Obama did do very little. Um, I mean, he had said that he was going to be, you know, be, be, be closer, have uh, established uh, the diplomatic relations with, with Cuba and all that. But he ended up doing everything at in the last year and so it was like kind of too little too late and so it was like really easy to just undo all of that when trump came but biden even though he hasn't even won he's already saying that he's going to establish that thing so is it possible then do you do you think that it might be possible that even though the democratic party does share a lot of things with the republicans that maybe um the progressives on the left have uh somewhat made of an influence uh in on, on the joe biden camp or or is it just like kind of like a placebo thing, like you know, just just to quiet us down and essentially not do anything afterwards? Well, leave, should we take his word for it? I mean, well, leaving it. No, we should never take anybody's word for anything. Okay. <laughs> you shouldn't take mine either. Okay. But uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, investigate. <laughs> but, wait, wait, um, wait, wait! Your phrase, um, show me, right? Trust, no word. Trust but verify. I think that's what Ronald Reagan said at one point. No, no, I meant your but, phrase. Uh, your phrase when 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 are you, you say like just stop with the blah 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 and actually show me actions. Yeah. So, uh, don't speak of words. Show me. There you go. Show me. Yes, I love that. Uh, from My Fair Lady, the song. Uh, 
But whatever Biden's motives may be, I think we should all welcome any moves by the U.S. government to relax uh, relations with Cuba, to end sanctions, to open up trade, to restore diplomatic, full diplomatic relations. I think those are extremely important steps. Um, and we should all be demanding that. And we will be having actions along those lines, and, you know, as soon as we can here in Miami and uh, and internationally, where this this is, you know, a lot of people feel that way. So I wouldn't I wouldn't oppose that at all. But um, there's just, you know, the policy has been reversed at this point, and we haven't. The things we have to worry about is like these invasions and the tightened sanctions and so hmm. forth. Um, that's that's my biggest concern right now. Yeah. Um, with. And, and you're absolutely right. We should never just listen blindly to what politicians have to say. There's just promises. Um, Trump kind of did not fulfill many of his campaign promises. Uh, that's for sure. Do you think um, that in in this economic, um, at first, yes, going back to the original topic of how people used to say, oh, coronavirus is the great equalizer. I mean, even, even Madonna, she was on some bathtub. She was saying, like, it is a great equalizer. You know, we're everybody, it does not discriminate. It kills everybody. But um, that, it hasn't turned up like that. Because as you were saying earlier on, yes, it, it's not, a, it's affecting poor people more. It's affecting uh, many uh, African-Americans, uh, Hispanic workers, and all that. And do you think it's, do you fear, essentially, do you fear that maybe, um, this will be used as an excuse to radically change society for worse because there are talks i don't i don't want to like jump into this whole conspiracy theory thing but because i have heard insane ideas that they're just going to force vaccines on all of us you know the whole bill gate thing that this is just a sneaky way to um exercise population control and all that all those bogus claims um just like i don't think that this came from some wuhan laboratory but I think it is possible that it, it will effectively remove certain stigmas like the idea that kids will be getting their education through screens. I mean, I think that's awful. You should not expose children to not only the radiation, but the the drugging effect of looking at a screen. Um, and what with proposals to um, make cuts on education, I'm just thinking, well, what if they just like, what if teachers become obsolete, you know? And what if now that we're relying so much on deliveries, what if like the rich people just end up becoming these um, out of touch, uh, never seen aristocrats that just disappear into the woods, into their little secluded castles. And then the working class Americans are just um, used to deliver and effectively die off because we're, you know, expendable. And there's, there's too many of us. And... But that's what they've been doing. This is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. This is not yeah. a new. This is something that's being more blatantly exposed. Mm -hmm. But it's not so new. If but you it's look accelerating, at right? It's at a, and they're enrolling in it at, at a quicker speed. Yeah. I mean, okay. before the pandemic, the rate of suicide among American working people was going up and up and up. Yes. The rate of opiate addiction was going up and up and up the quality of public education and the inequality of public education were major issues. And part of that was because, you know, the transformation of the economy as a whole made it less necessary in their mind to have uh, production carried out in the United States. They needed fewer, you know, when I was in school and in high school and college during the during the sixties when there was this huge boom and they needed people to do computers and nuclear energy and the space race and, the, and the, all these aspects of the cold war education brought you a good job a guarantee of a better kind of life than your parents had but that's not true anymore it wasn't true before the pandemic no. and they're using the pandemic to even speed that up look at the paper today about what betsy van what's her name betsy, betsy Dobbs, van Dobbs. Yeah. Yeah. Betsy DeVos. Yeah. I mean, the, the Congress passes money to shut to but to uh, sustain our public schools and to help teachers and others who are under so much stress right now. Mm -hmm. And she takes the money and shovels it into private colleges and Bible colleges and all kinds of things that were never meant to be happening by the people who wrote that law. Yeah. But she's advancing the agenda of these anti-public education right-wing fundamentalist types that's 
the reason Trump made her the secretary of miseducation. And um, that's one good example of, of what's happening. But these are not trends that just popped out of a coronavirus test. Right. They, they were, on. yeah, I agree with you. They were there. They're just really accelerating their, their advance. Right. Yeah, and I, uh, just about the issue of the, uh, the anti vaxxers and the, um, the yes. conspiracy theorists. I mean, I, I've been, one thing I've been genuinely unhappily surprised about is the number of people that have worked in our coalition, have had good positions against what the U.S. is doing in Cuba and Venezuela, who have become so swept up in this, you know, they, their distrust of the government has now blended over into a distrust of science as a whole. You know, right. they say that because big pharma is so corrupt and corporate, now we can't believe in the medicine that they're making. You know, that um, in their suspicion about the profiteering of these companies, which is legitimate, they're throwing out the very idea of vaccination and public health. I mean, yeah. people that I, I know people who are putting crazy stuff up on the Internet now about how the coronavirus itself is a hoax. I mean people who were leftists are more and more sounding like trumpeters. Um, and some yeah, of the you can say that, that they're overlapping, they, yeah, that they're agreeing with them, yes. They're, you know, and I think it reflects a certain panic, and I think it reflects this, this uh, a lack of understanding about the point I was trying to make before. You know, we are seeing a sharpening of class divisions. Things are being exposed to people that they didn't know about before. I mean, this guy, Chris Smalls, he was a supervisor at Amazon. Mm -hmm. he, wasn't, mm -hmm. he wasn't a rank and file guy. I mean, he came up through that. But he was an honest person who saw them lying about, you know, they wouldn't tell people that they had corona diagnoses and their coworkers and stuff. So he organized this thing. And then all of a sudden, this person, this unknown hero, you know, like there are so many of us who nobody knows about. Yeah. who are just honest and trying to do the right thing by our co-workers and our brothers and sisters. Um, Bill, uh, Jeff Bezos beams down on him, you know. They're having meetings about him in Seattle yes. <laughs> from Staten Island. And he becomes an emblem of that everybody has to ask, well, which side are you on here, you know. And it's happening among all kinds of workers, men and women from nowhere, who are putting themselves now on the stage of real politics, which is struggle politics. And it's much more important than who gets elected. Mm. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. Uh, who's president sometimes it doesn't really affect us much when you compare to the bigger issues at, on hand, like the, the power of the institutions and, and everything else. It's more like us versus the ruling class sort of thing, not us versus Trump or us versus Biden. But um, uh, can I get a comment out of you from the whole thing that has been happening with these meat processing plants? Because I want to make it um, known for our audience how you actually have, you, you sometimes joke of how, how you used to work at, um, at a meat processing plant. Uh, lots of them. Oh, oh, there were lots? Was it just one? No. I so it's your expertise like, then. <laughs> it's my exploitation. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I, I said this feels so outdated when I say exploitation, but um, it kind of <laughs> still exists, you know. So, yeah, I would like to know, Pete, if you could um, briefly comment on the situation concerning the, the meat processing plants, not only because, as, as you've mentioned, that you've worked in these, but also there are talks on social media of people saying that, no, the the food supply chain in, in the United States is not in danger, and yet you're clearly seeing tons and tons of footage of farmers uh, losing so many crops. And I, I still say that even though we take it for granted that there, the, the, the food will always be there, it is still a very serious problem. If, 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 and, and I think famine should never even be removed off the table entirely. Um, please comment on again, like the, the situation with, with the workers in these conditions. Because I heard of a poor worker who was coming in. She took a Tylenol so to lower her fever at one of these processing plants um, so she could pass by the screening and get to work because she didn't want to lose her bonus and then, of course, die because you can't take Tylenol with, with COVID. What? Well, 
I mean, I, I'm not going to pretend that because I worked in a meatpacking plant that I'm an expert on the complexities of the food supply. But I will say this, that um, there's always been a, a, a disconnect of distribution with the food supply. There's always been an abundance of food, but not food for hungry people. You know, yeah. we have both in this country. It's, again, not one of these things that has always been true, but it's been made more clear by COVID. Um, mm. we, we have, it's, farmers are growing food, but because they can't sell it, they're having to plow it under. And thereby, their ability to continue to produce food is, is crippled. Uh, people need food, but they don't have the money to buy it because they've lost their job. Um, yeah. Some of, it, some of it is technical, you know, like a large portion of the food is produced to be used in restaurants and cafeterias, and it's, put, it's built, packaged and shipped in large containers that we can't do anything with. You know, if somebody brings a 50-pound lump of cheddar cheese to your house, you, there's not much you can do with it, you know. Um, but uh, the, this, the fact is, is that I think that there's plenty of food but the conditions under which it's produced and transported um, and the system of distribution, which is based on money and price, with a lot of middlemen in the process, you know, supermarkets, shipping companies, distributors, uh, cooks and uh, institutions that sell the food, um, that's where a lot of our problems come in. Um, in, terms, in terms of the meatpacking plants, to me, it's such a graphic example of how uh, there's no way that you can enforce social distancing um, in a meatpacking plant. I mean, no. the line the line I was on, we were like right next to each other, standing right next to each other, each one doing something that had to be done before the next person could do the operation they were doing. Um, and those plants, those plants, really, the opening of those plants in a safe way depends on much bigger questions of getting this virus under control, getting the pandemic under control. It's related to the question of testing and a vaccine, and it's yes. a long-term yes. problem. But until that time, you know, if Trump's so worried about it, let him go into the death trap, you know? Um, my position is, is that no worker should be forced to do something that threatens their life for the sake yes. of money, and that our society needs to prioritize a living wage for working people you know, we can have other jobs. We can do public works. We can do yeah, all plus, kinds of other things that are safer. I'm glad you mentioned that about the, the, the logistical problem that we have that we're, there are certain jobs in which you cannot enforce social distancing, like um, like the masks themselves. After around, like, at most half an hour, it really does become um, useless because, like, with your own perspiration, your own breath, you're, you're, you're kind of soaking that thing. And not to mention that... You can't really keep on like breathing in your own your own um what your breath your exhaled breath because um that is also toxic it's like i, I don't know like remember specifically in um from the medical term or the precision of the medical um a, a opinion and but it's something like well it's the same as uh um i don't know like drinking urine you know you just can't it's toxic for your system and so you can't expect somebody to work um at let's say a store or a pharmacy and continuously to just be trapped within within that their mass because it, it becomes nauseating you you get dizzy and in the long term it does affect your health that's why some people uh, eventually have been passing out sometimes they don't pass out because they've got covid but it's just that they they, they, they you know were um, intoxicated but to to just wrap it up for for this time with um with the serious uh, fact that you have so many people that are unable to now go to work, and okay, just the whole uh, scenario that we had, this, the, the setting. Do you think um, this current setting uh, makes a really good, strong case for um, the universal basic um, income, or are you against that position? Are you more on the let's ha let's all have a federal jobs guarantee and not have people um, thrown to the side as just spectators of society? Which would create a sort of like worker alienation or something like that. Do you do you support um the? Well, well once again, it, it goes back to this question of, uh, you know, we're not dealing with Tinkerbell here. We're not. We can, 
it's not a matter of just saying, oh, well, wouldn't it be nice if everybody had a guaranteed income? Because the people who have the money ain't going to do that. You know, no. they don't believe in that. We're in a struggle with them over the wealth that we produce through our labor. And if we want to demand something, what we need, you know, of them, we have to demand that there be a program that gives everybody a job at a decent wage. And there's plenty of things that we can do in that situation. And that's something that has the potential to unite people who are already working with people who don't have a job now. You know, the employers always try and pit us against each other. You yes. have a job, you want a higher wage. Well, I got a hundred people outside the door who'll do it for two dollars less than you. So shut right. up and go back to work. <laughs> yeah. But if we're all if we're all united in a fight for jobs for everybody at a higher wage, yes. that's something that we can fight for and it's a demand you can place on the capitalist government and the corporations without pretending that there's a tooth fairy who's gonna give us all, you know, some guaranteed yeah. income. Yeah. Uh, do, do you think then that uh, but, we but have the like, other, yes? Well, I just want to say that what it really shows is we need a different kind of society. We need a, we need a society where not capitalists are in power, but workers are in power, where we remove the profit motive from the conduct of our economy. And we use the, the wealth that we create as working people to meet human needs in a rational, scientific way which would be the, the, the best thing we could do in terms of addressing the gigantic social and economic crises of our time, the, the climate crisis, these increasingly frequent pandemics and racism and many other, uh, I mean, how many more times do we have to see someone being shot by the cops with complete impunity, you right. know, like that? I mean, we, we, need to, we need to stop putting Band-Aids on things. We need to stop wishful thinking and if we really take the time to look at what's happening in this pandemic where it's ripping the mask off of the erosion of the, that has been going on in this society for so long, I think it should encourage us to, to look to what we want at the end of this process, to see, to see it, like that writer said, as a portal to a different kind of world that can be won through struggle. Yes, I, I, I agree that I see the the the... the pandemic as to put it in a grotesque analogy it's like somebody just put, opened up the shower curtain and we just saw everything that was there like whoa look at that you know? <laughs> no more secrets right i just saw everything and, and i will never be the same i am forever traumatized right um yeah definitely okay well let's not let's not be the same let's let's agree we're not going to be the same now because we're seeing things that we weren't able to see before so yes. let's put them together in a new politics, yes. you know, and let's stop begging for crumbs from one or another party. Crumbs you know, that eventually they take away, because sometimes those crumbs don't even last. How they want to privatize Social Security, I mean. Take away the postal service. Yeah. I mean, they're on, an, they're on a relentless, unceasing campaign to put profits in every niche and cranny of our society ahead of human needs and unfortunately they're more organized and aware of what they're doing a lot of times than we are but I think that of course because they have a clear goal it, when you're just concentrating on profits it's like you're on the survival mode and you're just seeking your own benefits it's, it's much easier but I always say that obviously I think that society does need to ha leave some space for for entrepreneurs to have their own private development and, and, and all that but clearly they are self-sabotaging because when you have when you when so many people are seeing in the middle class that wall street for instance is a rigged game how the big players get 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 saved at the last minute you know corporate socialism how there is a total disconnect right now such as some people are saying like never before seen how clearly what benefits wall street doesn't necessarily mean that it's good for us in the real world economy so i say that greed when it just gets out of hand a little bit is good because it motivates people some people to get out of bed and to try to achieve you know some semblance of an american dream but when it just goes to the, the obscene extremes that we have it right now it just like destroys their whole game so it's like they're making they're so self-sabotaging that they make it easy then
for somebody like Pete Seidman to say, uh, there you go, this is what, what you all end up doing. You know, how... how but how, let's not kid, you know, first of all, people who get out of bed to go to work aren't doing it because they're greedy. They're oh, no, no, I don't, because, I, no, I, no, I don't, I don't mean that way. Well, no, but if you, for most of us in this country, you have to have a job of course. in order to eat. Of course. You know? Who's going to take care of and you? And the only way, you, and for most of us, the way you get a job is you go to work for a company that's owned by somebody who then controls. Who sometimes inherited the, that. Yeah. So and much the bigger, easier. The bigger the corporation, the more likely they inherited it. You know? Yes. Um, and um, in terms of entrepreneurship that you were saying, you know, I think, you know, there's a reason that they call the people who finance entrepreneurs vulture capitalists. I mean, there, there's there's really the days of, you know, Thomas Alva Edison inventing something and becoming the big guy are pretty yes. much long gone. I mean, for the most part, any innovator or inventor has to do the same thing that a wage earner does. They have to hook up with capital and, and they're not going to come out of that. Of with course, the full it, benefit it, of, new uh, companies uh, coming up, you know, they are, it's at an all time low. It, it's always the same players, the big monopolies just taking center stage and not letting anybody else compete. It's just Comcast or AT&T, right? That's right. No, but, so. but, but my point was that they kind of just like are destroying their own possibility of being an everlasting um, players because if, since they're, they're not, I mean, in this time, they couldn't have thought to get the bailouts. I think that they're constantly just pushing too far and then it just provides ammunition for all the rebels all the people that want something better because they're kind of making it easy to see that what benefit what when they're searching for their own self-interest it doesn't necessarily mean that it's for the in the interests of um millions of americans you know in the world well, you class. know Car Karl marx Karl marx and frederick engel said it a long time ago they create their own grave diggers because they don't have they don't have it. I mean, look at what look at what the Trump administration, basically in alignment with the Democrats in terms of real deeds, are doing about the environmental crisis. They are just pumping the oil and the gas, despite they know. I mean, their scientists know. These corporations know that in the long run, what they're doing is destroying the world. Oh yes, they know. Least, but but it's like they don't care right? about what, what what they're actually going to give their children in inheritance. No, they don't. No. They don't care about their children, let alone no. your children. Oh no, no, and, forget about that. <laughs> you know, um, that and that. When I say that their morality is only the morality of a profit curve going up or down, I'm you know I mean that to the nth degree. And when they talk about opening up America and letting workers in these factories die because of exposure before testing or any of these other measures we need are in place. Yeah. That's what I mean. It's only profits. And that should engender a certain amount of not so much hatred as, uh, you know, a very serious search for a different kind of system <laughs> to yeah. those people. It's not personal as much as you don't like some of them. You know, some of them are very slick. Some of them are very nice. But the system is the problem. And the system okay. isn't broken. The system is doing what it does, right? I mean, it's pursuing profit, and it does that through every nook and cranny. And um, there are some who, that are hoping that because of this pandemic and the, the the problems that it has caused for millions of Americans, uh, not just the pandemic, of course, but the the government's response to it. Um, that this is just going to fuel another Occupy Wall Street. And if it were to happen, if there were massive like protests and people outright rebelling, um, I'm thinking that because in, in this day and age, there's more, there, it's through social media, people are like more connected and more informed, or misinformed for that matter. Um, I think it, it, if it were to take on, it, it has the potential to be perhaps a, a stronger force than Occupy Wall Street ended up being. Because you know that that, that movement kind of just fizzled. Um, I'm so a brief comment on that. Do you think that we might see like an emergence of a stronger um, opposition within the United States? Well, I I think we already are. That's what I was trying to say before. I mean, I think that these struggles that are breaking out, you know, the the, the main media that we look at 
doesn't necessarily focus on them. You know, they're more interested in the feud between Fauci and Trump than they are in the feud between soap opera immigrant meat packers in Iowa and yes. and the meat packing plant. You know, um, but but these are the these are these are things that are going on and they will accelerate now that the pressure to open up goes goes on. You know, right. this this crisis economically isn't going to be resolved if restaurants reopen. I mean, they're not. It's not going to be resolved if people can go one at a time into the barber shop. What what has to be done for this crisis to turn around is to resume production in the major corporations and factories and so forth. Not just in the United States, but around the world, because it's tied to what's happening in China and other countries. Right? I mean, the the, the economic system is totally global and interconnected. And this pandemic has affected all over the world. But the drive to get people back to work and producing, which is where value comes from and where trade comes from and so right. forth, and where most importantly for them, profit, that we already see that it's a, not a one-sided war anymore. It's a two-sided thing that's happening. And that's something we should treasure. You know, that's the kind of germ we really want to have go viral. <laughs> that's a good one that's a good quote um well Pete, um I, I said 30 minutes but of course we ended up talking for an hour <laughs> um any closing thoughts no i think we did pretty well okay. you gave me a good platform and i hope it's useful to you yes for your program it most certainly will Pete. Um, thank you so much, and uh, you have a great weekend. I don't know if you did another challah for today, but <laughs> I'm glad that you're baking in your two. free time. I'm going to do two this weekend. I oh. <laughs> if I can find flour, the problem is every all the flour has disappeared. Really? Super, yeah, I don't know why. I mean, oh, my goodness. Bad, oh, gosh. But... Like, be, 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 before it got really bad, we stocked up because, you know, I love to bake. So we actually bought, like, really a b big sackfuls. Um I'm gonna to have to make you a small delivery, <laughs> a donation of flour. I'll trade you. I'll trade you mangoes. Mangoes, yeah. I'll there you go. You, you know for that. Any day. I'm not. I'm, I'm not kidding. That sounds like a plan. <laughs> Some mangoes. I'll, I'll send you a small little sack of flour. That actually makes sense. All right. Well, I'll call you separately to set that up. Okay. And uh, hopefully, you should check your email. I sent you a pretty long email today about our next meeting. For okay. For our next... Okay. Okay. All right, Pete. All right. It's well, been a thank pleasure. You. Yeah, stay dry. Put your boots on. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, and say, say hello to your dad, too, beside your mom, okay? Okay, Pete. Well, thank you so much, and enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.